sure bet. <laughs> but sometimes life gives us more than we think. Sometimes when things go very wrong, they can also go very, very right. Let me take you back to April 25th, 2006. I've just had a biopsy for testing for lung cancer, and it's the dark of the night, and I'm terrified, and I can't go to sleep. But like a dream, I see this woman lying on a stage like this in the dark, with a faint light in the background, with a giant boulder on her chest. And I said, I will help you. I run to her, I try to lift off the boulder, but I can't. And I get down beside her and I said, I'll wait until the emergency medical team arrives. Then suddenly, out of my body, arise 12 goddess-like figures who surround us both and say, we are the healthy organs in your body and we will wait with you. The next morning, I got up and for some unknown reason, started to type out an email inviting my would-be friends to come wait with me as well. I hoped maybe 12 of you would come. It was Grace that had me write an invitation to the great South would be loving in the subject line. Because an astonishing 125 of you came pouring down the hill with platters of foods and picnic tables and guitars and a wash tub base. We danced, we sang, we played, and you enveloped me and my family in a hundred person hug that I can still feel deep in my body. I felt better. Yet, from the time it had started to the time it ended, there had been no medical intervention. There had just been a love intervention. And I said, well, this is what makes me feel better. This is the beginning of my healing plan. And that was awesome to have, because the next week after all the tests were over, I was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer, I was placed under palliative care and given three to 12 months to live. I had a giant mass in my left, two in my right, all my lymph nodes around my heart and three in my brain. Oh, wow. A diagnosis like this can fall you uh, make you fall straight off the cliff. And you can choose whether or not you wanna get up. But for me, it just was not an option. I had this beautiful baby granddaughter. Oh my gosh! <laughs> And I desperately wanted to see her grow up. So I said uh, to my doctor, well, what are the odds of my getting to see her in kindergarten? One percent, he said. So I said, well, I accept your diagnosis, but I reject your prognosis. How do I get into the one percent club? Now, nobody knows. It's not this one. <laughs> It would have to be a new mindset, a new way of thinking, I thought. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna have to be willing to try what 99% wouldn't. And if I'm gonna be that open, I'm gonna have to believe that I only know 1% of what I could know. And thanks to the wonderful women of, and men of Lindsay Communications who took over my job as head of the company and lead marketing consultant, I was able to spend only 1% of my time on anything that caused me stress, and 99% of my time on healing. And what I discovered as my first life lesson is we have access to more healing power than we ever thought possible. <laughs> now just because my doctor can say he could cure me, I figured, well, it doesn't mean I can't be healed, just that he doesn't know the way, so I'm gonna have to be the team leader. But he could still come along for the ride, and he was very willing to do that. And he gave me a pill, it was really quite genius of him at the time, because it was against protocol, called Tarceva, which is a targeted therapy, which has the great advantage that unlike chemotherapy, my hair did not all fall out, I was not tied to an RV, and my immune system wasn't compromised. The downside is it doesn't work too well, for too long. But it gave me time. And for my brain, he recommended Gamma Knife. They would get the three lesions that were in there and they would play whack-a-mole with those that were left. So my doctors were busy lowering the tumor burden. It was my job to get busy and start boosting the immune system. And I discovered that medicine is everywhere. In the sun, in the water, in the beautiful light that comes through our trees and the oxygen that flows from our old growth forests and the pleasure of walking it with an old growth friend. I discovered that healing came from letting go and forgiving from exuberantly 
singing with abandon, and very quietly humming to a sleeping baby on your chest. And then I started to study my joy protocol. I mean, what was the chemistry involved in it? And I found out that actually there were many chemicals and neurotransmitters that were doing the job of boosting my immune system. But in what combination and in what dose? Well, nobody knew. I mean, exactly how much is one smoothie, four miles, 20 hugs, and 30 minutes of laughter worth in combating any day's tumor burden? <laughs> Enough. No one would ever know, so I have my second life lesson, which is there are more ways of knowing than we think. Now, I had a very particular aim. My aim was to try to do this mind-body thing. Now, Lynn would like you to know that I was a very unlikely candidate. <laughs> but I thought, let's see, what is it? Maybe it's a place. Maybe it's a place. And so I worked hard to still this left brain that I worked so damn hard to build up so I could go exploring on my right. Maybe it's a quality of mind. Maybe it's a receptivity or an openness to all that life brings. So I said, I've got to embrace the unknown. Ah. Maybe the body has its own radio frequency. Maybe it's a radio station and all I've got to do is to learn to find the right dial. So I worked on how to think of different frequencies from very focused to very dreamlike. And in the end, I was able to hold a conversation with my body and actually listen to myself. Now Lynn says, yeah, but Diana, you ran, you didn't eat, you never listened. Well, yeah, stage four lung cancer is pretty much the definition of someone who does not listen to herself. But I had a real advantage. I had been trained in the arts. I knew music and dance and theater, and I knew how to enter the blank studio of my mind and desperately pray for inspiration. I gave you an example of the first inspiration that came to me with Lung Woman, and after I started on Tarsiva in the seven days before Gamma Knife, I go, Maybe I can find Brain Woman. So I closed my eyes and I couldn't find her. But instead I found myself being held by one of those goddess-like figures, like Jesus in the Pietà. Now you recall he was dead, not too hopeful. <laughs> <laughs> but I was encouraged because the boulder was gone. And each night I went back to this place and I was progressively sitting, and then standing, and then standing, and then twirling in the meadow. And here's the kicker. The next night, next day, I go in for my gamma night, and there were three the week before, and now there were only two to zap. No one knew what had happened to that missing lesion. And I was well enough to click off my one and only item on my bucket list, Singing with the world characters. <laughs> and I even remember the lyrics, which was quite awesome after having your brain zapped. So then I got serious. All right, I'm going to do this. So I did every night and every morning. I put on my headsets. And I started to have this inner movie, this inner ballet, just like all of you up on this stage. It was on a stage like this. They were dancing, very specific movement. They were stomping all of the cancer cells that lie on the floor of the stage. Now that is exactly the mechanism of my drug. Well, that's fun. <laughs> and after the first month, my tumor had shrunk in half. Then the inner ballet started to change. Every time they stomped and slid and leapt and fell, bubbles would come up off of the floor of this stage. Well, that's what it looks like when a cancer cell erupts. It just looks like a lot of bubbles. And again, my cancer shrunk in half. So then there were bubbles all in this place. And I go, you know what? It's really critical for the disease that those dying blebs are gone. So acrobats brought in these poles, and the bubbles started swirling as an exit strategy. Well, three years later, I talked to the head of lung biology at the University of Washington, and he said, well, that looks an awful lot like hyaluronin, which are the sugar tables that the macrophages use when they come in to eat the dying blebs. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> but anyway, it kept shrinking. Now, at this point, I still wasn't on to the fact that they were actually telling me something. I thought I was just relaxing. And then in November, the the image changed to the inner goddesses massaging my chest. 
Two weeks later on my CT, the lymph node involvement was gone. So, whoa, I'm going to start using this as guidance. And in fact, in February, I saw a cell that was not like these lovely ones that you could pop. I go, it's a stem cell. And the solution in the dream was to send a bolt of lightning down and explode it. So when sure enough, six months later, which is how long it takes from stem cell to showing up on the CT, when my doctor said that the cancer was back, he said, chemo. And I said, no, I had a dream. And we're supposed to blast it. And he goes, well, that's a really bad idea. <laughs> and we go, okay. And the next day he called back and he said, okay. And we, so I had CyberKnife, and uh, we waited then for six months to know whether or not it would even work. At this point, I started to learn a new language, a new way of interacting with my body called Qigong. This, instead of the imagery and the music, allowed me to feel the sensation, I kid you not, of my organs. And so my body started to talk to me directly. I started taking ther therapy with Siri, and, I, and she can tell my story. Um, to try to get hold of this inner wisdom. And I started acupuncture to kind of kickstart this energy system. At nine months, the cancer was back. This time, I had a dream about an alligator. And the admonition that nature, in the form of otters and owls and two Clydesdale horses, would take care of it. I don't know about you, what do you do with that? I sent another email to all my friends and I said, go be otters or eagles or Clydesdales and join me. And you all did. And we and my husband, Kelly, learned Reiki. And for 24 by 7, we did Reiki and Qigong, no medical intervention. And we got another nine incredible bliss-filled months. But then the cancer was back, another dream. The dream and my cells, after a lot of guidance, said surgery. The doctors agreed, although they said, you're now in the one in a thousand club, and there's no evidence. And so you're just going to have to ask your body what it wants. And I go, I can do that. And they chose surgery, but it was potentially life-threatening, and it had never been done in these particular circumstances. And I was terrified, so I invited all of you to come and walk me through every step of the operation. And you did, and the operation was life-saving. I've been clear for three years. <laughs> my last life lesson is that we are capable of more love than we think. Love in marriage. This guy. <laughs> this guy. We were able, even after 32 years, to completely reclaim and reinvent our marriage. He is a very intelligent, very left brain man, and yet he learned the complete system of Jin Jitsu and became a Reiki master. Love for it his fingertips, and he saved me. My family. You know, family, just like the, the gene is the epigene and the cell is the extracellular matrix, we live in our families and we live in our communities. And my family, for that first summer, enveloped me in fun and love and joy. We feel each other deep in our bodies and in our brains. We replicate the joy and pain that each other feels. So when they just brought love to me, I was free to start to get better. And they too saved me. And then we come to you. And happily, Bob forgot to press the timer, so I've got a lot of time. <laughs> <laughs> my family is now giving me three grandsons since my diagnosis. You, my friends, have prayed for me and hugged me and worn bracelets for me and given me massages and shared my journey. And I can never be grateful enough. This isn't about me, this is about you and the tremendous generosity of spirit that you have. And I, in turn, carry each of you really deep in my heart. So what do I do now that I've got more time than any of us ever thought? <laughs> I love my cells. It turns out I'm responsible for 100 trillion of them. <laughs> so I give them what they need, the water, the energy, the food, the nutrients, 
and the love. I live in awe. I crack up and I cry when I need to. I adore. I cherish the time we've had together. And I've got a never-ending love for you. So please sing along. I've got a never-ending love for you. Everybody from now on, that's all I want to do. From the first time we met, I knew. We're at the ending. I've got a never-ending song of love. Never-ending song of love. Never-ending song of love for you. Thank you. Thank you.